Hi, Ancient Egypt with me, Dr. Bob Bianchi, critical art historian. Today we want to discuss the image of the child god, Harpocrates, holding a jar. Statistics have shown that during the Roman imperial period, Harpocrates was the most frequently represented deity of the Egyptian pantheon. And among all the representations of Harpocrates during the Roman imperial period, that of Harpocrates holding a jar, as you see in these two examples, was among the most popular. And that subject, Harpocrates holding a jar, could be represented in one of two ways. And both of those ways are represented by the statuettes that we're looking at right now. The first way in terracotta or baked clay shows the child God seated. He has the jar in the crook of his arm and he's got his index finger to his lip. Now, in ancient Egypt, one of the ways in which childhood, an infant or a toddler, was represented was by having the gesture of an index finger to the lip. And that was the Egyptian equivalent of the West, where we generally think of a toddler or an infant sucking one's thumb. The other way that Harpocrates in the jar could be represented is shown in the Fiam's figure even, in green, fiance being the most popular glazed material in ancient Egypt, where the jar is open, you can look right inside, and he's got his fingers open and he's licking them. Now traditionally, <clears throat> it was suggested that these jars held Nile water, and these statuettes were dedicated by the faithful in temples or domestic shrines in order to ensure the fertility of the land or the abundance and fertility of their own home and household. That explanation was questioned because when you look at the, terror, the fiance figure, it's very, very hard to envisage how anybody can drink water by licking their hands. It's a gesture that's more associated with images in our experience, like Winnie the Pooh, who's got his finger in the honey pot and he's licking them. <clears throat> so the suggestion that these contained Nile water did not wash because of the way the gesture is shown. So Egyptologists said, like, what's going on here? And a very, very clever colleague of ours went through writings of the early Christians. And in the 4th century AD, in Egypt, there was an early Christian writer named Epiphanius, and Epiphanius wrote a treatise called the Panarion. The Panarion basically translates into English something like the bread box. It was a compendium of polemics, savage attacks against paganism that Epiphanius was writing <clears throat> because he wanted paganism to disappear in order for Christianity to triumph. Now, against these practices, Epiphanius holds out, singles out one. And that one is a festival that was celebrated yearly in Egypt, abandoned, and Christianity should triumph. Now, in this particular episode, <clears throat> he talks about an annual festival that's being held in Egypt, corresponding to maybe the month of July, August. Um, in which the child god Harpocrates was worshipped. And during that worship, it was customary for the ancient Egyptians to prepare a kind of a porridge. <clears throat> it was either uh, made of uh, grain, it might have been made out of lentils, uh, a pureed like a split pea soup today perhaps, and it was flavored in such a way that it was a favorite, favorite delicacy of children. And the children were brought to the festival and they partook of this porridge or this lentil soup. And we've now been able to connect the dots. The festival that Epiphanius rails against is being represented by these figurines. And that's why the Fiance figure has his fingers open, ah, ah, ah. it's good to the last drop. Now, these objects were dedicated in shrines 
in celebration of Horace the child, <clears throat> who might bestow abundance and prosperity upon those who dedicated it. And it's for that reason that both of these figures uh, have a relatively exaggerated genitalia of the child. But it was also demonstrated that this porridge or this lentil soup had efficacious properties that could help heal disease. So we have here another example of polyvalence in ancient Egyptian cultural practices. And by that I mean that one specific act, one specific depiction, could have multiple in layers of interpretation. So on the one hand, these are dedications to support the abundance and the fertility of the land in general or of the household in which they were dedicated. And on the other hand, they were offerings to try to cure an ailment which the dedicator may have had. And so it's very, very important to remember that when you examine ancient Egyptian cultural phenomenon, never, ever state that there is only one and only one interpretation of the image you're looking at. Because as we've seen here, there are multiple layers of interpretation. And those multiple layers of interpretation could be represented in two different ways. So the multiplicity is pervasive, not only in the representation, but also in the interpretation. Dr. Bob Bianchi,